Okay, great. Um, so welcome everyone to today's immune Zoom talk. It's my absolute pleasure to introduce uh, today's speaker, Dr. Stefan Gottschalk from San Jun Children's Research Hospital. Stefan obtained his MD degree in George Augusta University in Gartington. Then he came all the way to Houston and did his postdoc residency and fellowship in Baylor College of Medicine. In 2001, Stefan started his own group in the Department of Pediatrics at Baylor and was promoted all the way to full professor. In 2017, he moved to San Jun and took the position of the Chair of Bone Marrow Transplantation and Cellular Therapy. He is also the co-director of Center of Excellence for Pediatric Immune Oncology. The current research of Stefan's lab focus on the development of T-cell therapies for hematological malignancies, solid tumors, brain tumors, and gene therapy approaches for non-malignant diseases. He is also actively conducting investigator-initiated phase one clinical trials with antigen-specific T cells for cancer patients and immune deficiencies. Over the past two decades, Stefan has made numerous original contributions to the CAR-T field by developing novel CARs targeting a dozen of tumor-associated antigens he also devised complementary approaches to improve the effective function of T cells by expressing bispecific antibodies, cytokines, cytokine receptors, and chimeric co stimulatory molecules. I actually got the luck to uh, meet Stefan uh, in person uh, at a cell therapy keystone conference early this year. Uh, he presented a super exciting story on developing a new CAR with the PDZ binding motif that can improve the CAR T synapse quality and the anti tumor function of both CAR T and the CAR NKs. I, I think this is a highly innovative design because most of the past CAR engineering is through adding co receptors. Um, but in contrast, including cytoskeleton elements uh, is beyond the box of thinking which also opened a new paradigm for car engineering. And I think Stefan uh, will talk uh, in detail uh, about this part in a second. So without further ado, let's welcome Stefan. Uh, thank you for this kind introduction. And yes, I will talk about synapse, uh, immune synapses in the second part of my talk. So um, thank you again for um, Inviting me, just these are my disclosures. I really have nothing or that do not uh, pertain to this talk. So what I want to do with you is give you a quick background, then talk a little bit about CAR-Ts for pediatric ALL. Uh, you know, what we've learned and uh, also highlight that there is actually still quite a need to, uh, to improve these approaches. And then in the second part of my talk, we'll talk about uh, CAR-Ts for solid tumors and hopefully talk about three vignette, vignettes, one uh, target using E7H3 targeted CAR-Ts uh, synapse tubing, and then also some of our recent efforts of using ECM proteins as uh, CAR targets. Um, you know, I'd like to start with this slide. Uh, you know, Lloyd Old is the father of modern pediat uh, uh, cancer immune oncology in the United States. And as a very young man, he asked three very important questions we still work on today. The first is, is there immune reaction to cancer? The second is, if there is, what are the targets? And how can you stimulate that immunity? You know, we in the genetic engineering field have the luxury that we do not have to wonder about question number one, because we can engineer specificity. But uh, the other two questions still after now uh, almost 75 years or 65 years still are very relevant to the field. 
The synthetic T-cell immunotherapy on a slide looks straightforward. You take blood from a patient or donor, and then in the laboratory, within a short period of time, uh, can generate um, genetically engineered immune cells. Once you activate these cells, then transduce them with non or viral vectors or gene edits them, and then expand them in cytokines. And importantly now, you can do three, conceptually three main things. You can render immune cells specific for a tumor. More importantly, you can alter their effective function. And lastly, not but least, you can also engineer safety switches into uh, these immune cells. It's been uh, 30 years uh, since the prototype chimeric antigen receptor was published by uh, Zelik Ishar, but there was a parallel uh, um, uh, uh, publication actually from the, Lut from the Ludwig Institute in uh, Switzerland by uh, Tom Brocker. And uh, CARS, RNZ and synthetic molecule, which combine I would say both arms of our immune system because the specificity comes from a monoclonal antibody, whereas the singling domain comes from uh, T cell receptor units. At least for pediatric cancer, CAR T cell therapies have a lot of advantages. One is that they in general recognize CAR T cells on the uh, proteins on the cell surface and recognizing in a non-MHC restricted fashion. And that is a very important point since pediatric cancer is rare. If we would rely on uh, using, let's say conventional TCR, which recognize peptide in the context of an MHC molecule, it would be very difficult to develop uh, cell therapies for pediatric cancer, unless we really revolutionize how we can generate these products in a patient-specific manner. The biggest drawback of CAR T cells in general is that the majority of proteins that can target is on the cell surface. And if you look at the overall cellular proteome, only a third of proteins are present on the cell surface, whereas the majority of proteins are localized intercellular and are in general not accessible with CAR T cell therapy. Very early on, investigators realized that just including singling domain of the TCR complex is not sufficient to uh, fully activate T cells. And uh, groups have included initially one or two coastal mature molecules resulting in what we in general call in the field second or third generation CAR. This approach has been very, very successful for hematological malignancies, in particular B-cell, ALL, and multiple myeloma. And at present, there are seven FDA-approved products. However, the initial data for T-cell malignancies also looks very encouraging. Whereas for myeloid malignancies, in particular AML, it is, I would say, clear from early phase clinical study that it will not be the same success story as for B cell ALL. It is probably closer to our current clinical experience in the solid tumor setting. So, what we have learned from uh, CD19 CAR T cell therapy approaches. I think one important aspect is that we in the end have to use lymphodepleting chemotherapy without giving patients a little bit of a conditioning regimen, even CD19 CAR T cells do not work in patients. Uh, CAR Ts are able to cure chemorefractor diseases. And this in the end highlights that the immune system destroys tumor cells differently than a conventional uh, agents uh, we use. Co-stimulation is critical. There is a lot of discussion in the field if CD28 or problem BB is more advantageous. It is clear that problem B based CAR have a much higher potential to persist long term. 
However, CD28 co-stimulation initially provides a much stronger stimulus for these cells to expand, which might be beneficial in solid tumor settings. Not surprisingly, if you target a single antigen, uh, you can have immunoscape. And lastly, not but least, CATs can induce significant toxicities, including cytokine release syndrome, neurotoxicity, and uh, hemophagocytic syndrome. At least in pediatric ALL, the three main questions the field currently face is what are predictive biomarkers to predict efficacy and toxicity? What is the best approach to prevent CD19 negative relapse? And the biggest clinical question is, what is the therapy once patients achieve a full CR after CD19 CAR T cell therapy? Should we observe or take these patients to transplant? The field is developing approaches. Uh, one manuscript highlighted here highlights the use of um, cell-free DNA it's A to monitor early responses in lymphoma patient. And then for pediatric ALL, next generation sequences to determine how deep the CR is, uh, is, is seems to be one tool which can very effectively uh, differentiate between patients who uh, can be observed without the transplant once you achieve its CR and which should proceed. However, you, you know, we really, when I joined St. Jude, wanted to do high-end correlative study or next generation correlative studies. And it turned out that it's quite difficult to analyze leftover cells in the back, uh, given some of the restriction uh, imposed by the commercial companies. And therefore, we decided to develop our own C19 CAR T, which in the end is very similar to the Novartis product, because some of you might know or remember that the Novartis CAR was originally developed by Dario Campana at St. Jude in the early 2000s. Our production scheme is a little bit different uh, than uh, the Kimraya production. We use uh, CD4, CD8 selection, and we also use IL-7 and IL-15 instead of IL-2. Our initial study was developed by a clinical faculty of ours, Amy Tuller, and published last year. And in the end, we saw very, the product behaved very similar to uh, Kim Raya. Uh, if you look at outcome, cytokine release syndrome, and CAR HLH, in patients with low disease, there was excellent activity with uh, very minimal side effects. However, in patients who had high disease burden, and here high disease burden is defined as having more than 40% blast in the bone marrow, we saw fewer responses, but and then also more cytokine release syndrome and neurotoxicity and HLH. So having now, um, cells as well as cells post-infusion, we teamed up with Ben Youngblood at St. Jude, who is an expert in epigenetic regulation of uh, CAR T cells. He had originally trained with Rafi Ahmed before moving to St. Jude, and he had shown in Muren model that the DNA methylase, the novel methylase, DMT3A, plays a critical role in controlling T cell plasticity. And once uh, DMT3A has methylated its target, T cells are exhausted, which is irreversible with checkpoint blockade. However, if you uh, in mirror models delete DMT3A in the T cell lineage, these T cells remain sensitive to checkpoint blockade. He also developed um, multipotency in, uh, index based on epigenetic programs where naive cells are assigned a numeric value of one and uh, terminally differentiated cells have a value of zero. So he now together with Caitlin Zebley, um, physician scientist in uh, our department, 
uh, took GMP samples as well as sorted CAR T cells post infusion and analyzed their epigenetic program. And what they invariably found that the GMP product, most likely because these cells were generated in IL-7 and IL-15, actually had a quite high multipotency index. However, there was invariably a quite fast decline within three weeks to four weeks after infusion. Interestingly, the multipotency index within the product correlated with peak expansion observed in uh, these patients one or two weeks after infusion. And if you look at uh, you know, transcription factors like LEF1 or TBET, uh, there was, if you look here, increasing methylation in um, in uh, you know of loci within the left one gene, and uh, also uh, if you look uh, in some other region, Tibet, there was actually unmethylating uh, of the promoter region, uh, resulting in expression of Tibet. If you look at a more uh, global level, at a factor uh, associated signatures, one to three uh, weeks post infusion there was an invariable decline of memory associated signatures within three weeks after infusion and an increase in exhaustion progenitor signature. And, uh, you know, not surprisingly, if you look, uh, you know, at um, which uh, promoters get methylated, you know, there is Bach 2 EMT3 and LEF1 promoters or promoters of transcription factors which are in the end critical in uh, maintaining uh, stem cell plasticity. Another way to look at the data is to uh, uh, do a PCA analysis. And in this analysis, naive cells fall in the top corner, terminally exhausted T cells are on the bottom, and uh, TPEX, uh, T cells progenitor exhaustion are in the middle. And if you now overlay the GMP product, they're very close to naive cells. However, then within the next couple of weeks after infusion, there is really differentiation or exhaustion reprogramming of these CD19 CAR T cells, which are in the end still very effective, but even these very effective T cells undergo exhaustion reprogramming within a few weeks in patients. Um, in parallel, we also started now to ask in preclinical model, what happens if we knock out DMT3A in CAR T cells? And that was really work spearheaded by Guidre Krenschut, who is a, a faculty member in um, our department. And uh, we used a very standard approach where we um, use gene editing uh, with, uh, to um, knock out DMT3A, and then we genetically modified these cells to express cars. And the knockout efficiency, as she, shown here by Western blood, is uh, very, um, it's a very effective process. And if you now look for different cars, and we've done it for HER2 car, IL-13 receptor alpha 2 car, FA2 car, uh, the RET and perform repeat simulation assays, you can invariably see that DMT3A knockout CAR T cells outperform uh, standard CAR T cells in this repeat simulation assay. And this is strictly um, antigen dependent. If you uh, remove the antigens or do not stimulate these uh, CAR T cells, they do not continue to proliferate. If you look now four weeks after stimulation in vitro and perform uh, again whole genome bisulfite methylation analysis, you observe very similar changes as we observed on our clinical studies. And uh, if you now use the multipotency index, and place, uh, you know, control CAR T cells and DMT3A 
3A CAR T cells between naive and terminally differentiated cells, you notice that even after four weeks in culture, DMT3A knockout T cells are more naive like than CAR T cells, which have been control gene edited, who are much closer to um, terminally differentiated uh, T cells. This also translated into improved anti tumor activity in multiple uh, models. Uh, including sarcoma and acute leukemia. And uh, interestingly, also we were able to show in these xenograft models that knockout CAR T cells uh, can persist long-term and uh, reject uh, leukemia in an antigen specific manner. Uh, here on day 113 after initial transfer, mice were re-challenged with wild type B173, which expresses CD19, and these cells were rejected. But then if we then re-challenge these cells with um, these mice with B173, in which CD19 uh, is knocked out, uh, tumors readily grew, highlighting that this is not an allo response but still mediated by the functional CD19 car. So based on these studies, we um, now decided to develop a clinical study with uh, DMT3A knockout for acute lymphoblastic leukemia with an effort to enhance persistence of the infused product and we are currently in uh, you know, pre-IND studies, which uh, at least in the United States uh, is a tremendous effort in getting all the required evaluation performed, which uh, the FDA demands. So now in the second part of my talk, I want to switch gears and talk about uh, CAR T's for solid tumors and some of our efforts in this regard. Um, you know, if you critically look at CAR T cells for solid tumors, and uh, you know, there, it's really is not lack of trying. Uh, you know, there have been more than 25 studies with or without lymphodepletion evaluating intravenous or local region delivery and you know, overall, you know, safety has been demonstrated, but there have been limited anti-tumor activity. Some of you might are aware that there are some more recent studies where there is quite significant anti-tumor activity. And the best example is the GD2 CAR study for pediatric neuroblastoma, which was published in the New England Journal of Medicine recently by Franco Locatelli's group in Rome. But if you closely look at the paper, the significant anti-tumor activity is limited to patients to have a low disease burden and the patients who have significant disease uh, have in that setting, GD2 CAR T cells also have limited anti-tumor activity, very similar to uh, the studies which were conducted uh, between 2006 and 2020. We had a long or standing interest in HER2 CAR T cells. And uh, interestingly, the HER2 CAR was actually, the, I believe, the second CAR which was ever published by um, a group in Germany. And, um, I was fortunate that uh, Winfried Wells, one of the co-authors, gave me this car very early on in my career to develop this clinically. We uh, then initially showed in preclinical studies that we had very nice anti-tumor activity and conducted uh, two clinical studies without lymphodepletion at the time, one for HER2 positive sarcoma and the other for HER2 positive uh, high-grade gliomas. And I'm just showing here the glioma study. There was definitely on target of ca cancer toxicity. You observed pseudo progression, uh, but there were, was out at least one patient who had a dramatic partial response, which lasted at least for four months. 
uh, in a with a century localized high grade glioma, which was inoperable. More recently, we have also introduced lymphodepletion uh, and uh, have demonstrated safety and also increased expansion. So the red area and red lines is the qPCR data without lymphodepletion. The gray shadowed area is, um, uh, uh, are the patients who received lymphodepleting chemotherapy. And if you quantify the AUC, there's almost a two log difference in uh, exposure to her two CAR T cells. And we observed one complete response uh, in a patient with sarcoma. This patient had refractory metastatic disease in his marrow. And you see here, um, mass, uh, desmin and myogen positive uh, tumor cells. And after three cycles of uh, chemotherapy and infusion of CAR T cells, which each time resulted in an increase in uh, HER2 CAR T cells, the patient developed a complete response. Interestingly, that response was associated with the development of uh, uh, anti-tumor specific antibodies. And um, that might be one of the reasons why we observe this response in the patient. But lymphodepletion is not the answer because if you critically look at the 13 patients, uh, and that is a manuscript which is under review, uh, we treated with lymphodepletion and her to CAR T cells. There were only two patients who had a CR, four had stable disease, and uh, a little bit more than 50% had progressive disease. So what are, you know, what have we learned and what are the roadblocks for um, solid tumor CAR T cell therapy? Clearly solid tumors have a heterogeneous um, pattern of antigen expression. Uh, in solid tumor cells often, CAR T cells do not expand to a significant extent. They have to home to the tumor site. And once they arrive at the tumor site, there is a, a, you know, a, a immunosuppressive tumor microenvironment. In regards to targeting additional therapy, uh, antigens, uh, we are not the only one. A lot of groups currently focus on B7H3. Again, it's a target with a long history. It was originally found by Nikon Chang, who vaccinated mice and actually pulled out an antibody and stained tumor slide. And he really didn't know what this antibody recognized. So he called it HH9 target, which was the name of the monoclonal antibody. And later it was discovered that that antibody recognizes B7H3. There's been lots of activity with targeting B7H3 with uh, radioimmune conjugates. And uh, there are lots of preclinical studies and clinical data is emerging. Uh, there are two case reports of uh, patients with um, brain tumors, uh, which were treated in, um, in China. And uh, more recently, the Seattle group has published their early clinical data of giving local regional B7H3 CAR T cells to pediatric patients with uh, DIPG, which is an incurable uh, uh, brain tumor. And very similar to Crystal Meckel's GD2 CAR studies, saw meaningful uh, responses in that patients uh, survived for much, much longer than expected. We ended up with B7H3 as a target uh, once we've moved to St. Jude because we very carefully analyzed um, all the PDX patient-derived xenograft model, brain tumor models St. Jude had generated over the years, uh, which were generated by Susie Baker and Martine Roussel. And uh, Gidre Crenshaw's lab did a very careful analysis. And this is fax data plotted um, in a heat map. 
And it's very apparent that the top two antigens which are consistently expressed are B7H3 and GB2. I think this data also highlights that it's important to really stain PDXs and not rely on ATC cancer cell lines, at least when it comes to looking at antigen expression, because you know, based on ATCC cell lines, you know, all the evaluated antigens would have been uh, in the end uh, good targets. One interesting aspect of this analysis is that we included HLA as a molecule. And uh, if you look now across um, medulloblastomas and high-grade gliomas, while high-grade gliomas consistently express HLA molecules, many medulloblastomas have downregulated HLA expression, which provides another rationale for uh, targeting these types of malignancies with CARs. And this is now the data just, same data plotted differently. And if you just focus on HLA molecule, as said, DIPGs express HLA molecules high levels, but roughly half of all non uh, high grade glioma brain tumors have downregulated cell surface expression of. Um, uh, of, uh, of HLA molecules. Uh, on the solid tumor side, Chris Dorenzo in our group uh, done very similar experiments, uh, again, uh, looking very carefully at uh, expression of um, uh, now by immunohistochemistry of B7H3 across different histologies and normal tissues. Of interest, we found that there is significant B7H3 expression in the adrenal cortex, but a lot of the staining was intracellular. And we did not observe any on target of cancer toxicity in our immune competent animal models. Chris then designed a series of CARs to define the best structure and ended up with a CAR which has a CD28 co stimulator domain and a CD8 alpha transmembrane brain domain. And he then asked the question, is it, can we provide additional co-stimulation by including 4-1-BB in the car? Or should we express 4-1-BB ligand on the cell surface to induce 4-1-BB um, activation uh, uh, in a, uh, through uh, ligand expression? And uh, it turned out that actually for MBB ligand CAR T cells were more effective. And this is in the end the product we decided to test clinically. Um, we have now two clinical study, the solid tumor study, which recently opened for accrual. Uh, we spent a lot of time building in a, a biopsy two weeks after infusion, which will allow us to uh, really analyze uh, T cells at the tumor sites, which we believe is critical to really understand uh, mechanisms of failure in the solid tumor setting. And then uh, we also developed a brain tumor study in which we, we give uh, CAR T cells local regionally through an Omaya reservoir. And this study also recently uh, opened for approval. What we're now doing in the laboratory in regards to B7H3, um, really have started thinking about second generation products. And uh, another St. Jude investigator with whom we are very closely collaborating is Hongbo Chi. Hongbo Chi had published in 2019 uh, or had identified uh, out of a li limited CRISPR screen targeting 3000 genes, uh, Recnase 1 as a negative regulator in murin T cells. Uh, Recnase 1 is an RNase which degrades uh, immune inflammatory cytokine RNase. And he had very nicely shown if you knock out Recnase 1, uh, you get uh, enhanced anti tumor activity, T cells persist to a greater extent, and also you limit exhaustion reprogramming. We've now looked, teamed up and looked in multiple models. 
and ask the question, if we knock out recognase one in B7H3 CAR T cell, what happens? And uh, this shows data for an osteosarcoma model, lung cancer model, this medulloblastoma that is DIPG. On top, the red are recognized one down, knockout in the bottom is dark blue. And in each model we test it, we always get the same answer, that recognized one knockout improves uh, B7H3 CAR T cell therapy. So we are dis decided as we get safety data from our clinical study to now full force develop a, a, a B7H3 CAR product in which Recnase one is knocked out. The other experiments or we are really very interested in is uh, really studying the tumor microenvironment with B7H3 CAR T cells. And we have developed glioma model as well as uh, solid tumor models uh, in immune competent mouse models um, targeting B7H3. And we hope that this will allow us to uh, really study the um, tumor microenvironment post uh, B7H3 CAR T cell therapy and uh, come up with uh, combinatorial therapies to further enhance our function. So I now would like to move on to uh, synapse tuning and finish off with uh, targeting uh, our efforts in targeting extracellular matrix protein. So if you look at the car design, you know, the basic car design really has not changed in 30 years. And uh, what is well established in the field and that has really worked by others that uh, CAR synapses are very disordered in contrast to the highly formed um, uh, synapses which are induced by um, T cell receptors. And I'm very fortunate that a postdoc joined my lab, Peter Chockley, who uh, trained uh, in immunology at the University of Michigan and uh, really his work was focused on NK cells. So the synapse car story is surrounds, is, you know, was developed for NK cells as well as T cells. Uh, in his um, PhD work, uh, Peter had studied in detail CRTAM which is a molecule which is critical for the cell adhesion polarity of NK cells and CRTAM interacts with Scribble. And uh, other groups had shown that uh, if you knock out CRTAM in mice, uh, there are there are, um, uh, there are defects in uh, CDA T cell uh, migration or distribution in lymph nodes. Uh, and then in the contrast, there was actually increased stabilization of CD4 T cell interaction. But uh, studies also really have highlighted that um, CRTAM interacts with the cell polarity regulator scribble. Um, and the interaction is through a PDZ domain. Uh, PDZ domains are evolutionary very conserved. There are roughly 400 proteins that contain these domains. And they, the main function of these domains is really to hold together and organize singling complexes at cellular membrane. And the fascinating aspect of these domains are that they really only contain four amino acids. The critical part is that they have to be at the C terminus. If they're not in the C terminus, so, and other groups actually have included PDZ domains in large scale screens, but the PDZ domain was within the singling domain of the car, and of course, the PDZ domain didn't work. So it really has to be placed at the C terminus 
to be able to interact with uh, Scribble. So Peter designed, um, and that is based on using EPHA2 specific car, uh, you know, just added a PDZ binding motif to the C terminus of the Zeta car. And this just shows, you know, very similar transduction of no car and K cell products. And if you look at phenotype, uh, there is really no difference between CAR and CAR PDZ and K cells. Uh, he then used uh, confocal imaging to assess uh, synapse formation, uh, looking at you know phosphozap 70, LAMP1, and actin, and at baseline there was really no significant difference. However, after now EPHA2 simulation with recombinant protein, uh, he started to observe uh, significant differences. Uh, if you just, for example, look at uh, LAMP1 um, density uh, uh, with uh, NK cells, which express a CAR, which has a PDZ domain. And if you now um, quantify, you know, synapse area, phosphozap 70 score, and LAMP1 score, you know, it actually turns out that you probably have tighter synapses when you have a car with a PDZ domain, but you definitely have an increase in phosphozap 70. And there was also a significant increase in uh, a LAMP1 score within the synapse area. Uh, if you then ask the question, is there increased um, a scribble polarization with uh, CD3 epsilon? And uh, the answer is yes. If you look at uh, CAR PDZ, and in these experiments, we also had a mutated PDZ domain only in NK cells with, uh, which expressed a functional CAR with a PDZ domain. We saw a significant uh, increase of scribble at the immune synapse and uh, also in increase of intracellular recruiting of CD3 epsilon. Again, a lot of folks do not know that, but NK cells express the splice variant of CD3 epsilon within the cytoplasm, it's not on the cell surface, like uh, as part of the alpha beta TCR complex of T cells, but once the synapse is formed in uh, NK cells, it is recruited to the immune synapse. If you look at uh, calcium flux as an early marker of NK cell activation, uh, and this is now simulating either with the lung cancer cell line A5.9 or brain tumor cell line uh, DIPG007, there is an increase of calcium flux, uh, you know, in the presence of, a, of NK cells which express CAR PDZ. Uh, of note, DIPGs are very, very immunosuppressive. So they're, uh, you know, expressing a CAR by itself um, in, uh, in K cells really did not result in an increase in calcium flux at all. If you look uh, also now at uh, the time it takes to get lysosome coalescing at the um, synapse, Again, the kinetics are much enhanced uh, if you have an expressive car with a PDZ domain. Uh, we then took advantage of uh, measuring cell-cell uh, interaction and uh, it's called a Z-movie apparatus. It's relatively new technology which has been used I think for the last two to three years. Uh, in a nutshell, it's a microfluidics device where one cell line is in the end glued to the surface of the disc. You then float other cells on top and then you use acoustic force uh, to lift off the cells and to, depending on the wave and now the wavelengths you need to lift up the cell correlates with adhesion and therefore the unit is called piconewtons. And if you now look uh, at untransducing K cells, 
car cells which either have uh, an active car domain or an inactive or car PDZ. So it clearly was a enhanced adhesion uh, once you express the car with a PDZ domain. Um, and this was strictly antigen dependent because if you then repeated the experiment with an A549 cell line in which EPA-HA2 is knocked out, there is really no difference highlighting that this adhesion is really mediated by uh, the car. Uh, next, Peter asked the question, does this enhanced adhesion results in improved uh, cytokine production? And, uh, you know, it, there's not improved cytokine production of all cytokines, but there was a significant increase in interferon gamma in some chemokines like MIP1 beta and also perforin. And uh, if you now look at polyfunctionality, uh, meaning how many cytokines or chemokine a given in K cells express, clearly a CAR PDZ induced the most polyfunctional in K cells uh, state and also the, had the strongest singling strength. Uh, based on uh, you know cytokine production in comparison to uh, the other in K cell population. Uh, also in uh, cytotoxicity assays, uh, CAR PDZ and K cells killed at a lower effective to target ratio than all the other CAR and K cell population. Uh, we were asked to perform blocking experiments uh, using uh, peptide and clearly there was partial blocking uh, for all condition indicating that uh, this effect was specific for the uh, uh, PDZ domain. We also looked very carefully at in now in 3D culture system, uh, do uh, CAR and K cells which express a CAR PDZ have improved anti-tumor activity? And uh, in these assays, the tumor cells are red and the T cells surround the tumor droplet in green and uh, slowly move in. And uh, in these type of assays, having a CAR PDZ allowed uh, CAR and K cells or CAR and K cells to infiltrate these tumors at, at a faster rate than uh, the uh, counterpart. And finally, if you looked in animal models, the single dose of CAR and K cells had significant anti-tumor activity resulting uh, in uh, improved uh, in case cell function was a little bit dependent on the model. In A549, there was a significant effect, but there was a very dramatic and significant effect in an osteosarcoma model. The osteosarcoma model allowed us to re-challenge these animals because we had a significant number of mice which were tumor-free. And very interestingly, uh, at least in these xenograft models, there was long-term persistence of NK cells because these tumors were readily uh, rejected. Uh, of course, one question then comes up, is this all uh, specific for the FR2 car? And the answer is no. We've performed very similar experiment with B7H3 cars and observed the same effect. Uh, and again, you know, we were asked uh, to provide uh, animal data and also FR2 cars and B7H3 cars had with the PDZ domain had resulted in significant improvement in overall survival of treated mice. And then, of course, the question came up, okay, we've shown that it's beneficial to introduce a PDZ domain in uh, CAR T cells, uh, in CAR and K cells, what about T cells? And the short answer is including a PDZ domain in a CAR in T cells is 
beneficial. Uh, if you look at um, calcium flux, we observed very similar benefit. And uh, also in animal models, looking in a high-grade glioma model, as well as um, you know, osteosarcoma, we saw um, a significant improvement in anti-tumor activity. Um, you know, I think since we had a late start, I don't want anyone waiting. I can skip the ECM targeted part and just get to my conclusion slides. Oh, so just in summary for the PDZ car. So we really believe that using an anchoring domain uh, to really organize uh, the intercellular the domains below the car is critical to improve their function. And uh, you know, our paper was recently published in Nature Biotech. Uh, in addition to the data shown, we also looked at many other proteins to really highlight this function. And uh, I, you know, it's also our first study where we extensively use confocal imaging. And you know, I've really become a believer that confocal imaging is critical uh, to really understanding T cell biology, how T cells interact with tumor cells. And this study actually has let, actually we use it now, not on a daily basis, for a lot of our projects, we uh, use confocal imaging uh, very early to really understand if the modification we introduced in our T cells or in K cells, ultrasynapse uh, formation. Lastly, not but least, I think our study also highlights really the anti-tumor activity of CAR and K cells. As mentioned, we only have to eject a single CAR and K cell dose. Mice do not get any additional cytokines and we still saw significant anti-tumor activity. So let me kind of just flip through that. Um, so just, you know, as an overall conclusion, you know, while, you know, a lot of people, at least basic scientists also think, oh, you know, CD19 CAR T cells, ALL, you know, we have an FDA approved product, everything is done. There are still a lot of issues. And uh, I strongly believe that also for ALL, we need improved products to really cure patients without uh, allogeneic transplant. And then for solid tumors, I think there is still a great need to better understand CAR T cell biology. Uh, we really have to target multiple antigens. And I strongly believe that we really need genetic engineering approaches beyond target specificity. I've not spent much time on combinatorial therapies, but again, I think we need a lot of modeling. Simply combining CAR T cells with checkpoint blockade is not the answer. Uh, you know, we really, I think, really have to test that very carefully in immune competent animal models. And then, at least in the United States, we have, if we really want to uh, test multiple gen genetic modification in an you know, timely fashion, there probably has to be some adjustments uh, in regulatory requirements. With this, I want to close. I think I've highlighted everyone, uh, their contributions through the work. And uh, yeah, it's been, we've been now at St. Jude since 2017. And uh, really, I think have developed a um, great program where we can uh, really take things from the clinic to the laboratory, uh, from the laboratory to the clinic, and importantly, as highlighted by our DMT3A story, then really also can perform cutting edge correlative studies, which then inform our next studies. Um, thank you so much for your attention. <laughs>